Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Vaughan Smith. I'm the founder of the Frontline Club. Uh, Co-founder, actually. Um, Co-founder with my wife, Fran Vera, who's hidden amongst you somewhere. Um, we're very excited uh, to be doing this today. This is the largest event we've done at the Frontline Club. And I'd like to thank Will at the Trixie Center and all his team. I'd like to thank you for coming um, to this fantastic place. I'd like to thank um, Dan, our branding man, because I'm standing in front of 100 logos, which are all uh, new. So thanks, Dan. Our new look. We're not shy of our new look. Um, I'd like to thank the Frontline Club staff, um, who've worked extremely hard to put this on, um, particularly Flora and Millie. Um, so thank you all. Um, I'm extremely proud of you all. Uh, the Frontline Club exists to promote what's best in journalism. Um, and to uh, put on debates and discussions like this. Um, we're a social enterprise, and if you wish to support us, come to Paddington, if you haven't already been, uh, where we can feed and entertain you. Um, we do 200 events a year. Uh, as a social enterprise, the money you spend tonight and uh, any money you spend at the Frontline Club helps us do this work, so we're very grateful for it. If you want to help Julian, or Slavoj, or Democracy Now!, um, you can buy some books or put donations at the end, um, that facility will be there. Now it's Julian's 40th birthday tomorrow. So if you want to help him with those exorbitant legal fees, then you know, give generously at the end. Um, so all that remains is for me to welcome Amy Goodman of Democracy Now! Amy is a multiple award-winning journalist, um, has, uh, and, and, and is the main presenter for Democracy Now! and has flown all the way from America to be here. And, um, she, she's a pretty fine person, and I'm extremely glad to hand over to her now. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It is a great honor to be with you this afternoon. And a shout out to all of the people who are watching this broadcast all over the world. We are live streaming this at democracynow.org. By the way, how many of you watch or listen to or read Democracy Now? We have. We've given out about a thousand flyers of where we broadcast in uh, Britain uh, and also um, where you can watch, read, and listen to the broadcast. We're also live streaming. We've offered the embed for anyone to take to put on their website. Uh, the Nation is live streaming us. MichaelMoore.com is live streaming us. Free Speech TV is broadcasting democracy now across the United States, and there are many others. I hope people tweet in, uh, Facebook in, let us know what you're doing with this broadcast. It's extremely important because information is power. Information is a matter of life and death. We've learned that through these remarkable trove of documents that have been released in the last year. The Iraq war logs, the Afghanistan war logs, and what's been called Cablegate, uh, the US State Department documents that are continuing to be released. Why does it matter so much? Well, we'll talk about that this afternoon, but let's just take one example that came out in the Iraq war logs. February of 2007. The war log show that two men were standing, Iraqis, under an Apache helicopter. The men have their hands up. They clearly are attempting to surrender. The Apache helicopter can see this. So they're not rogue. The soldiers call back to the base, and they say, what should we do? These men have their hands up. The lawyer on the base says, you cannot surrender to a helicopter. 
and they blow the men attempting to surrender away. That was February 2007. Now we will fast forward to July 12, 2007, and video that has been released by WikiLeaks. This devastating video of an area of Baghdad called New Baghdad, where a group of men were showing around two Reuters journalists. Well, one was a videographer, a, not, a young up-and-coming videographer named Namir Noor Eldin. And one was his driver, Saeed Shema. He was 40 years old. He was the father of four. And they were showing them around the area. The same Apache helicopter unit is hovering above. They opened fire. The video is chilling. I am sure many of you have seen it. If you watch or listen to Democracy Now!, we played it repeatedly, discussing it with various people, from Julian Assange to soldiers who were there on the ground. Over time, we dissected this. The soldiers opened fire. You have the video of the target, and you have the audio of the sounds of the soldiers cursing, laughing, but not rogue always going up the chain of command, asking for permission to open fire. In the first explosion, Namir Nur el and the other men on the ground are killed. Uh, Saeed Shema, you can see him attempting to crawl away. And then a van pulls up from the neighborhood, and they're attempting to pick up the wounded. There are children in the van. And the Apache helicopter opens fire again. And Saeed Shema, Others in the van are killed. Two little children are critically injured inside. Now, I dare say that if we had seen what came out in the Iraq war logs in February of 2007, if we had learned the story at the time after it happened of the men with their hands up trying to surrender, there would have been an outcry. People are good. People care. People are compassionate. They would have called for an investigation. Perhaps one would have, been be one would have begun. But it might well have saved the lives of so many. Certainly, months later, perhaps that same Apache helicopter unit under investigation would not have done what it did. And maybe Namir Nur Eldin, the young Reuters videographer, and his driver, Saeed Shema, not to mention the other men who were killed and the kids critically injured. None of that would have happened to them. That's why information matters. It is important we know what is done in our name. And today we're going to talk about this new age of information. We're joined by two people many of you know well. Earlier, I asked a young man who had come to the gathering why he had traveled so far. He said, are you kidding to be with two of the most dangerous people? Well, the National Review calls Slovenian philosophers as Slavoj Žižek, the most dangerous political philosopher in the West, and the New York Times says he's the Elvis of cultural theory. Slavoj Žižek has written over 50 books on philosophy, psychoanalysis, theology, history, and political theory. His latest book, Living in the End Times. And we'll talk about what he thinks and talks about around the world. Now, we're joined by another man who has published perhaps more than anyone in the world. Um, in fact, he wrote a book uh, on the underground computer information age called underground, the inter international computer underground. But with the Iraq war logs, the Afghanistan war logs, now the U.S. government cables that have yet to be fully released, I would say that Julian Assange is perhaps the most widely published person on Earth. Um, Today, we're going to have a conversation about information. And I'd like to ask Julian to begin by going back to that moment in 2007 as we talk about the Iraq war logs and talk about the significance of them for you and why you've chosen to release this information. Well, 
Amy, um, I suspect under that criteria, perhaps Rupert Murdoch is the most widely published uh, person uh, on earth. Um, something I, as people say that Australia has given um, two people to the world, Rupert Murdoch and me, that are fairly big in, big in publishing. Um, well, in some ways, things are very easy for us and very easy for me. And that we make a promise to sources that if they give us material that is of a certain type, that is of significant um, of diplomatic, political, ethical or historical significance, not published and under some sort of threat, uh, we will publish it. And that actually is enough. Of course, we have a goal with publishing material in general, but um, it has been my long-term belief that what advances us as a civilization is the entirety of our intellectual record and the entirety of our understanding about what we are going through, what human institutions are actually like and how they actually behave. And if we are to make rational policy decisions insofar as any decision can be rational, uh, then we have to have information that is drawn from the real world and the description of the real world. And at the moment we are severely lacking in the information from the interior of big secretive organisations that have such a role in shaping how civilization evolves and how we all live. So getting down into Iraq, so that was 400,000 uh, documents each one written in military speak, on the other hand, each one having a geographic coordinate down often to 10 metres, a death count of civilians, US military troops, Iraqi troops, uh, and uh, suspected insurgents. So it was the, the first, um, the, rather the, the largest, because we also did the Afghan war logs, the, the largest history of a war the most detailed, significant history of a war to have ever been published, probably at all, uh, but definitely during the course uh, of a war. And so it, it provided a, a picture of the everyday squalor of war, from a ch children being killed at roadside blocks to over a thousand people being handed over uh, to the Iraqi police for torture, um, to the reality um, of um, close air support and, and how uh, modern military uh, combat, combat is done, leaking, linking up with other information such as this video uh, that we discovered of the men surrendering, uh, being, being attacked. So it, it's, as, a, as, an, as an archive of human history, um, this is um, a beautiful and horrifying thing, both, both at the same time. It is the, the history of the nation of Iraq in most significant recording uh, during um, its most significant development uh, in, in the past um, 20 years. And while we always see um, newspaper stories revealing and personalizing some, if we're lucky, some individual event or some individual family dying. This provides the broad scope of the entire war and all the individual events. So the details of over 104,000 deaths. And we work together to statistically analyze this and with um, various groups um, around the world, such as the Iraq Body Count, uh, who became the specialist in, the specialist in this area, and, and lawyers here in the UK who represented Iraqi refugees, to pull out the stories of 15,000 <laughs> Iraqi civilians, labelled as civilians by the US military, who were killed, who were never before reported in the Iraqi press, never before reported in the, in the US press or in the world press, even in aggregate, even saying today a thousand people died, not reported in any manner whatsoever. And you just think about that, um, 15,000 people um, whose deaths were recorded by the US military but were completely unknown um, to the rest of the world. That's a, a, 
a, a very significant thing and compare that to the 3,000 people who died in 9-11 and imagine the significance uh, for Iraqis. So that is something that, um, that we specialize in and that I like to do and I've always tried to do is to go from the small to the large, not just by um, um, abstraction or by analogy, but actually by encompassing all of it together and then trying to look at it and abstract uh, through mathematics or statistics. Um, and so to try, try and, and push both of these things at the same time, the individual relationship uh, plus the, the state relationship uh, plus the, the relationship that has to do with civilization as a whole. The importance of WikiLeaks today in the world. Well, uh, to answer probably this question, it's just you can withdraw and give me two hours, no, but I will try to condense it. First, let me say also how proud I am to be here and let me mention something which maybe most of you don't know that how difficult even it was to organize this event. Yeah. Like, it had to be moved two times out and more out from central London, and so on. So again, what I want to say is, let me begin with uh, the significance of what you, Amy, started with these uh, shots. I mean, uh, not shooting, but uh, video shots of those Apache helicopters shooting on. You know why this is important? Because the way ideology functions today, it's not so much that, let's not be naive, that people didn't know about it. But I think the way those in powers manipulate it, yes, we all know dirty things are being done, but you are being informed about this obliquely in such a way that basically you are able to ignore it. And the, can I make a terrible, uh, maybe, sexual offensive, but not dirty, don't be afraid, uh, <laughs> remark. You know, like a, a husband, sorry for male chauvinist uh, 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 twist, a husband may know abstractly my wife is cheating on me. Or, and you can accept, okay, I'm a modern, tolerant husband, but you know, when you get the photo of your wife doing things, it's quite a different thing. And it's, I would say, with all respect, something... Similar, it's very important because it, the same, no, no, I'm not dreaming here. The same thing I remembered happened, I think, about two years ago in Serbia. You know, people rationally accept that we did horrible things in Srebrenica and so on. But you know, it was just abstract knowledge. Then, by chance, all the honor to Serb media who published this, they got hold of a video effectively showing a group of Serbs pushing to an edge and shooting a couple of Bosnian prisoners. And the effect was a total shock, national shock, although, again, strictly seeing nobody learned anything new. So here, so that I don't get lost, if you allow me just a little bit more, here we should see the significance of WikiLeaks. Many of my friends who are skeptical about it are telling me, so what did we really learn. Isn't it clear that every power in order to function, you have collateral damage, you have to have a certain discretion, what you say, what you don't say. But to conclude, I will propose a formula of what Wikileaks is doing, and it's extremely important. Of course, I'm not a utopian. Neither me nor Julian believes in this kind of a pseudo-radical openness. Everything should be clear and so on. But what are we dealing with here? Another example from cinema, very short, Ernst Lubitsch Ninochka. You find there a wonderful joke where, I think towards the beginning of the film, the hero enters a cafeteria and says, uh, can I get some uh, coffee with cream, please? And the waiter answers him, sorry, we run out of cream, we only have milk, so can we give you, can I serve you with coffee without milk? That's the trick here. Like, when we learn something from the media, like, if I may reply, uh, repeat the metaphor, they behave as if they are serving uh, coffee with cream. That is to say, of course, we all know they are not telling the entire truth. 
But you know, that's the trick of ideology. Even if they don't lie directly, the implications, the unsaid is a lie. And you bring this out. You are not so much putting them, uh, cutting them, uh, catching them as they put it with their pants down, lying on behalf of what they explicitly say, but precisely on behalf of what they are implying. And I think this is an absolutely crucial mechanism in ideology. It doesn't only matter what you say, it matters what you, uh, what you, uh, what you imply to say and so on. So, just to make the last point, I think that are we aware at what an important moment we are living today? On the one hand, as you said, information is crucial and so on. We all know that it's crucial even economically. I claim that one of maybe the main reasons capitalism will get into crisis is intellectual property. In the long term, it simply cannot deal with it. But what I'm saying is just take the phenomenon that media are trying to get us enthusiastic for clouds. Like, you know, computers getting smaller and smaller and all is done for you up there in a cloud. Okay, but the problem is that clouds are not up there in clouds. They are controlled and so on. For example, you rely on, maybe you have an iPhone, but you mentioned Murdoch, no, most mentioned here. Do you know, it's good to know if you rely on your news through iPhone or whatever, that Apple signed an exclusive agreement with Murdoch, Murdoch's corporation as, again, the exclusive provider of entire news and so on and so on. This is the danger today. It's no longer this clear distinction, private space, public space. The public space itself gets, as it were, privatized in a whole series of invisible ways, like the model of it being clouds. Which is why, and again, this involves new modes of censorship. I repeat this. That's why you shouldn't be tricked when you say, but what really did we learn new? Maybe we learned nothing new, but you know, it's the same as in that beautiful old uh, uh, Andersen's fairy tale, the, the emperor is naked. The emperor is naked. We may all know that the emperor is naked, but the moment somebody publicly says the emperor is naked, everything changes. This is why even if we learned nothing new, but we did learn many new things, but even if nothing learned, the forum matters. So don't confuse Julian and his gang, in a good sense, not the way they accuse you. Don't, conf don't confuse them with this usual bourgeois heroism, fight for investigative journalism, free flow and so on. You are doing, doing something much more radical. You are, that's why it aroused such an explosion of resentment. You are not only violating the rules, disclosing secrets and so on. Let me call it in the old Marxist way, the bourgeois press today has its own way to be transgressive. Each ideology not only controls what you say, but even how you can violate what you are allowed to say. You are not just violating the rules. You are changing the very rules how we were allowed to violate the rules. This is maybe the most important thing you can do. And yet, Julian, even as you were releasing information in all different ways, you then turned to the very gatekeepers who, in some cases, had kept back this information, and you worked with the mainstream media throughout the world in releasing uh, various documents. Talk about that experience and that level of cooperation and what has happened after that. Well, we're an organizer. Volume for the balcony. Said this devil again, idiots accuse you. You see, hmm. he's the authoritarian leader who <laughs> gives commands and talk. I'm not saying this is not true. I think this is the only way to really keep things going. <laughs> so if you, if you want to have an impact and you promise an impact and, you, and you're an organization which is very small, where actually you have to co-opt um, or leverage the rest uh, of the mainstream press. Um, so, under our model of, of how you make an impact and how you get people to do things that you wouldn't have been otherwise able to do, 
unless you have an army that can physically go someplace and panzer divisions that can roll over, um, the only way that you can easily make an impact um, is push information about the world uh, to many, many people across the world. And so the mainstream press uh, has developed expertise in how to do that. And it is competition also for people's attention. Uh, so if we, if we had had several billion dollars to spend on advertising across the world, uh, even if we could get our um, ads placed, uh, we wouldn't um, easily be able to have made the same impact that we did. And we don't have that kind of money. So instead, if you like, we entered into relationships with now over 80 um, media organizations across the world, including some very good ones that I, I wouldn't want to uh, disparage, to increase the impact and translate and, and push our material uh, into now over 50 different countries uh, endemically. And that, that has been, yes, um, subverting the filters of the mainstream press, but an interesting phenomena has developed amongst the journalists who work in these very large organizations that um, are close to power and negotiate with power at the highest levels, which is the journalists having read our material and having been forced to go through it <clears throat> to pull out stories uh, have themselves become educated and radicalized. And that is an ideological penetration of the truth into all these mainstream media organizations. And that, to some degree, may be one of the lasting legacies uh, over the past year. Also by, you know, e even um, Fox News, which is much disparaged, is an organization that wants viewers. It cannot do anything else without viewers. So it will try and push news content. So for example, with collateral murder, CNN showed only the first few seconds and they blanked out uh, all the bullets going onto the street, completely blanked it out and said that they did so out of respect uh, for the families of the people who were killed. Well, there was no blood, there was no, there was no gore and then they cut out all the, the most uh, politically salient points and the families had come forward um, and said it was very important for us to know that, they had already seen it. But Fox actually displayed um, the first killing scene in full. It's quite interesting. So Fox not perceiving itself to be amenable to the threat of it not acting in a moral way actually gave people more of the truth than CNN did. Um, and so Fox also motivated to grab in a hungry way as great an audience share as possible took this content and gave it to more people. Now afterwards, of course, they put in their commentators uh, to, talk, to talk against it. But I think the truth that we got out of Fox um, it was often stronger than the truth that we got out of CNN. And similarly, for many institutions in the media that we think of as liberal. And perhaps Slavoj would like well, to speak I, about that. I cannot emphasize enough, like, First, I treated you not as an idiot out of politeness, but then I'm more and more forced to admit that you really are not an idiot. Sorry for this, you know. <laughs> it happens, no? Because seriously, I mean, what you said now is extremely important. With all the respect I have for, and I don't mean this in any way ironically, honest liberals who really believe people should be informed and so on. But there are limits in their very mode how they function, so we should ruthlessly, not in an unethical way, but nonetheless ruthlessly use, as you pointed out in this difference between CNN and Fox, every, every window of opportunity here. And let me add another example from a totally different domain, but from uh, fiction, cinema, TV series, which I think reproduces the same duality. We have the usual Hollywood left, all this, 
uh, all this uh, for, to raise our spirit, left liberal pseudo-Hollywood Marxism thrillers like Pelican's Brief, uh, All the President's Men, which may appear very critical, you know, like, oh my God, uh, the president himself is corrupted, connected to certain uh, corporation and so on. But nonetheless, this is ideology. Why? Because why do you exit the movie theater in such high spirits after seeing I don't know, all the, and so on, because the message is nonetheless, look what a great country we are. An ordinary guy can topple the mightiest man in the world, and so on, and so on. On the other hand, let me take uh, an equivalent in TV program of Fox News, which would have been, please don't take me for being crazy, uh, 24. Yeah, yeah, Jack Bauer and all that. <laughs> the last season of 24, I watched it with pleasure, is for me, my God, Again, as you approach it the way you approach those shots, it's for me much more consequential in criticism. You get Jack Bauer, who is in total despair, his whole world crumbles down, he has to admit this way, what he tried to do in previous seasons of playing this role of somebody should do the dirty job, torture the prisoners, I will do it. He says, no, I cannot live with it, it has to come public. His liberal counterpart, called Alison Taylor, the president, also steps down. You know what's the true message of it? The message is simply within the existing ethico-political coordinates. You are just stuck into a deadlock. There is no way. It's a very pessimistic message, much more honest than on that, all that uplifting Hollywood Marxism, what a great country we are, and so on and so on. So yes, at all levels, even not only at in journalism as such. I agree with you, and I would even say that all leftist tradition knows this. For example, already Marx said, I'm no fetishist of Marx, but nonetheless, he said that we can often learn more from honest conservatives than from liberals, because what honest conservatives do is that they don't try to sell you at the end some uplifting bullshit. They are ready to confront a deadlock, and that's what's important today. I don't want to look distracted looking down, but I wanted to get these quotes accurate, so I have them on my phone. Nothing threatening, I just hear it. Better. Yes. Um, Newt Gingrich, the former Speaker of the House in the United States said Julian Assange is engaged in warfare, information terrorism, which leads to people getting killed uh, is terrorism. And Julian Assange is engaged in terrorism. He should be treated as an enemy combatant and WikiLeaks should be closed down permanently and decisively. Um, Bill Keller of the New York Times said arrogant, thin-skinned, conspiratorial. Uh, Judith Miller, who together um, who often wrote or co-wrote articles that appeared on the front page of the New York Times, alleging weapons of mass destruction uh, without named sources, said, Julian Assange isn't a good journalist, didn't care at all about attempting to verify the information he was putting out or determine whether or not it would hurt anyone. Joe Biden, the Vice President of the United States, said Julian Assange is a high-tech terrorist. Uh, Congress member Peter King of New York called for Assange to be charged under the Espionage Act and asked whether WikiLeaks can be designated a terrorist organization. Uh, not to just focus on the U.S., Tom Flanagan, a former aide to the Canadian Prime Minister, has called for Assange's assassination. And former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin uh, called an interesting person. I first heard about her. Called you, uh, Julian, an anti-American operative with blood on your hands. Can you respond to these charges? <laughs> well, <clears throat> you, you know, uh, after Bill Keller said that I was thin-skinned, it doesn't really leave much ground to reply, does it? Um, Sarah Palin, also once on Twitter, complained about my grammar, <laughs> which is really the biggest insult for me. I mean, ca ca calling for a drone attack um, is perfectly understandable, but correcting my grammar from Sarah Palin, that's a real insult. 
that event in the United States was very interesting. I mean, obviously, the, the, the calls are, are wrong and outrageous and so on, but the social and political event in which they occurred was, was fascinating. So within a few months, we saw a new McCarthyist hysteria arise within the United States in December and January. January this year, December last year. And that is quite worrying, that a new McCarthyism can come up so quickly. On the other hand, yes, there are a lot of opportunistic politicians playing to their base, playing to their pals in the military industrial complex. On the other hand, you know, power that is completely unaccountable is silent. So when, when you walk past a group of ants on the street and you accidentally crush a few, you do not turn to the others uh, and say, stop complaining or I'll put a drone strike on your head. Um, you completely ignore them. And, and that is what happens to power that's in a very dominant position. It does not even bother uh, to respond. It doesn't flinch for an instant. And yet we saw all these figures in the United States coming out and speaking very aggressively. Bill Keller, uh, in a re recent talk, um, as a way of sort of perhaps legitimizing why he was speaking about me, uh, said that if you have a dealing with Julian Assange, you are fated to sit on panels for the rest of your life explaining what you did. But actually, no, that's a choice by Bill Keller, a choice to go around and try and twist history and whitewash history and adjust history on a constant basis. Why? Why expend the energy do, doing that? Why not just knock off another front page of the New York Times? Because actually these people are frightened of the true part of history coming up and coming forth. So I, so I see this as a very positive sign. And I've stated before that we should always see censorship actually as a very positive sign, and the attempts towards censorship as a sign that the society is not yet completely sewn up, not yet completely fiscalized, but still has some political dimension to it, i.e. what people believe and think and feel and the words that they listen to actually matters. Because in some areas it doesn't matter. And in the United States, actually, most of the time, it doesn't matter what you say. We manage to, to speak and give information at such volume uh, and of such intensity that people actually were forced to respond. It is rare that they are forced to respond. So I think this is a, the, one of the first positive symptoms I've seen from the United States in a while, that, act, that actually if you speak at this level, um, the cage can be rattled a bit and people can be forced to respond. In China, the censorship is much more aggressive, which to me is a very hopeful symptom for China, that it is still a political society, even though it is fiscalizing, even though everything has been sewn up in contractual relationships and banking relationships as time has gone by. At the moment, the Chinese government and public security bureau are actually scared of what people think. I wanted what is that movie called? Uh, there will be blood, no? But unfortunately, there will not be a lot of blood between the two of us because I again agree. Speaking about China, let me tell you, maybe you know it, a wonderful, it's not an anecdote, which perfectly makes, uh, confirms your point. Do you know that about two or three months ago, a Chinese government, I don't know which agency, passed a law which formally prohibits in public media, they mean press, uh, books, comics, TV, movies, all stories which deal with time travel or alternate realities. Literally. I checked it up with my friends in China. The official uh, justification was that history is a great matter. It shouldn't be uh, left to such trifling games and so on. But of course, it's clear what they uh, really are afraid of. For people to even imagine 
alternate realities, other possibilities. Now, again, to repeat your point, I think this is a good sign. They at least need the prohibition. With us, we don't need a prohibition most of the time. If somebody proposes a radical change, we simply accept this spontaneous everyday ideology, but we all know what our economic reality is like. You propose uh, to raise for 1% healthcare spending. No, it would mean, it would mean loss of competi competition and so on and so on. So again, I totally agree with you here. And just a final comment on the persons that you, Amy, mentioned. Listen, a Newt Gingrich is for me, sorry to use this strong word, kind of a scum of the earth. I don't have any great, no, 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 I will be very precise. I don't have any great sympathy for Bill Clinton. But I remember when there was this campaign, Monica Lewinsky campaign, uh, Newt Gingrich was making all these moralistic attacks. And then it was confirmed in media. I listened to interview with him where he confirmed it, that when his wife was dying in cancer two or three years before, Newt Gingrich, Gingrich visited her in a hospital, forcing her to sign, not even having the decency for letting her die, forcing her to sign a divorce agreement so that he could have married another woman. And he was, at the exact time of, uh, of uh, Levinsky affair, already treating her with the secretary of him there, and so on and so on. Listen, these are people who simply, my God, I become here a kind of a moral conservative. There should be some kind of ethical committee which simply claims people like this are a threat to our youth. They should be prohibited from appearing in public, whatever. <laughs> now I will make a more important point as to this terrorism stuff. Let me make it clear, but I'm not crazy. I mean this in a positive sense. Yes, in a way you are terrorist. In which sense? In the sense in which, as I like to repeat, Gandhi was a terrorist. What you are doing, let's face the facts. It's not just something that can be swallowed, oh, oh look, all the interesting news in the newspapers, here this is happening, there Slavoj Žižek is dating Lady Gaga, and here, <laughs> <laughs> totally not true. And here there's WikiLeaks. You effectively have, uh, in a good Do we sense... Have a denial there on that one? Sorry? Do we have a denial, an official denial on the Lady Gaga one? Absolute denial on everything. <laughs> I mean, I'm the, up, everything, I didn't even listen to not even one of her songs and so on, I mean, <laughs> my God, I listened to Schubert and Schumann songs, I'm sorry, I'm in a conservative. I don't know, her representative was not that defiant, they just said no uh, comments. My friends were telling me the same, you stupid, you should have said no comments and then you will enjoy much more glory and so on. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, go let's on. go on. No, 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 so, uh, I have a more serious point to make. Uh, about, but what does this mean? Uh, of course, you are, in the, which sense was Gandhi a terrorist? He effectively tried to stop, interrupt the normal functioning of the British state in India. And of course, you are trying to interrupt the normal, which is very oppressive, functioning of the information circulation and so on. But the way we should answer to this point, I claim, is simply by another, I repeat myself here, I know, endless paraphrase of that wonderful a line from Brecht's Beggar's Opera. What is robbing a bank compared to founding a new bank? What is your, under quotation marks, terrorism compared to the terrorism which we simply accept, which has to go on day by day so that just things remain the way they are? That's where ideology holds us. When we talk about violence, terrorism, we always think about acts which interrupt the normal run of things. But what about violence which has to be here in order for things to function the way they are? So I think if, I'm very skeptical about it, we should use, in my provocative spirit, I'm tempted to, the term terrorism, it's strictly a reaction to a much stronger terrorism which is here. So again, instead of engaging in this moralistic game, oh no, he is a good guy, like Stalin is said about Lenin, you like small children, you play with cats, you wouldn't, <laughs> as Norman Bates says in Psycho, you wouldn't hurt even a fly, <laughs> no, you know. No, you are, in this formal sense, a terrorist.
But if you are a terrorist, my God, what are then they who accuse you of terrorism? So, to, uh, to, to finish with another nasty joke, you know what? They try to give us the good news, like all the news you are giving us are these obscure falsifications, good news. But you know what are these good news that they, those in power, are promising us? Let me give you another wonderful Jewish-American joke that was told to me by a friend recently. A guy has his wife at an operation and then talks after the operation with the doctor. And the doctor tells him, listen, first the good news, your wife will survive, she will even live longer than you. And then, uh, what's the bad news? The doctor says, the bad news is, you know, there are some problems, like as the result of the operation, she will no longer be able to control her anal muscles, so excrement will be dripping all the time. Then, there will be some strange fluid all the time escaping from her vagina, no sex. Then, she will not be able to blah, blah, blah. And of course, the guy gets more and more into a panic, no? My God. And then, you know what the doctor does then? He taps the guy on the shoulder and says, no, no, don't worry, this was just a joke. Everything is okay. She died during the operation. <laughs> like, that's the good news that they are giving us at the end, you know? Ah, I surprised. <laughs> no dirty words, you noticed it. No dirty words. <laughs> because Amy is always telling me when she was kind enough to receive me in New York, Slavoj, not even the S word, S H I E, no dirty words. So I. <laughs> For that, we can be taken off the air. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, Julian, about Bradley Manning. Um, Mike Huckabee, who also was a presidential candidate, the governor of Arkansas, said that the person who leaked the information to Julian Assange should be tried for treason and executed. He said, whoever in our government leaked that information is guilty of treason, and I think anything less than execution is too kind a penalty. Um, Bradley Manning is a young U.S. soldier who is in Iraq. Um, has been held for more than a year, much of that time in solitary confinement in Quantico in Virginia. Um, it was exposed that his treatment was tantamount to torture. P.J. Crowley, the White House, the State Department spokesperson, um, spoke to a group of bloggers at MIT and said his treatment is stupid. For that, he was forced out of the State Department. Bradley Manning was then moved to Fort Leavenworth uh, because of the outcry. But he remains uh, in prison. He remains um, not tried. What are your comments on him? First of all, Amy, it's, it's, thanks for answering his quest, asking this question. But it, it is difficult for me uh, to speak in detail about that case. And, but I can speak about why it is difficult for me to speak about it. So Bradley Manning is an alleged source of WikiLeaks uh, who was detained in Baghdad. And then, although there was very little, uh, no mainstream press publicity at the time, shipped off to Kuwait, where he was, if you like, um, held in an extrajudicial circumstance in Kuwait uh, in a similar manner to which um, detainees are held in Guantanamo Bay. Eventually, through some legal, creative legal methods, uh, he was brought back to the United States and he's been in prison now for over a year. He was being kept in Quantico on, for eight months under extremely adverse conditions. The uh, Quantico is not meant for long-term prisoners. Other prisoners, the maximum duration uh, over the past year uh, has been three months. And people that have been visiting Bradley Manning uh, say, uh, and we have other sources who say that uh, they were applying those conditions to him because they wanted him to confess that he was involved in a conspiracy to commit espionage against the United States with me. That pressure on Manning 
appears to have backfired. So by all reports, this is a young man of, of high moral character. And when people of high moral character are pressured in a way that is illegitimate, uh, they become stronger and not weaker. And that seems to have been the case with Bradley Manning. Uh, and he has told uh, US authorities, as far as we know, nothing about uh, his involvement. Now, there has concurrently been a secret grand jury taking place six kilometers from the center of Washington. That grand jury involves 19 to 23 people selected from that area. Now, why was it in Alexandria, Virginia, six kilometers to the center of Washington, that that grand jury was placed and those people drawn? Well, it has the highest density of government employees anywhere in the United States. The US government was free to select the place and they selected this place in order to bias the jury from the very beginning. This is in fact wrong to call a jury. This is a type of medieval star chamber. There are these 19 to 23 individuals from the population that are sworn to secrecy. They cannot consult with anyone else. There is no judge, there is no defense counsel, and there are four prosecutors. So that is why people that are familiar with grand jury inquiries in the United States say that a grand jury would not only indict a ham sandwich, it would indict the ham and the sandwich. And that's a, a real threat to us. It, a grand jury, which was removed from UK jurisprudence because of abuses, combines the executive and the judiciary. So this old common law notion of the separation of these branches of power is removed in the grand jury. The US government argues that these captive 19 to 23 individuals are the branch of the judiciary, of the judiciary that they perform a judicial function, where, of course, actually, they're just captive patsies for the Department of Justice in the United States and the FBI. So they have been going out, and they have coercive powers. They can force people to testify, and they have been pulling in all sorts of people that are connected uh, to WikiLeaks and people that are not. They have recently, uh, a number of individuals that have been pulled to the grand jury understand uh, what is going on, and they have refused uh, to testify and have pleaded the First Amendment, Third Amendment, uh, and the Fifth Amendment um, protection against self-incrimination to, um, well, I'm not sure the purpose, I don't have direct communication, but from the outside, it appears to uh, nullify that political witch hunt in the United States against us. Now, in response, the grand jury has been instructed to send out immunity certificates. So these are certificates that go to subpoenaed individuals that say that if you come to the grand jury to testify, your testimony cannot be used against you, and therefore you have no right to plead the fifth. What this means in practice is coerced, compulsive interrogation in secret with no defense counsel. There's not, not even lawyers for, um, for the subpoenaed witnesses are permitted uh, into the grand jury. It is just the prosecutors uh, and these people from six, six kilometers away from the center of Washington. That's something that should be opposed. There's another grand jury that has sprung up uh, in the United States and is investigating anti-war activists engaged in, this, in the same sort of witch hunt. Uh, so these are, uh, are really a, a, a classical device that was um, looked at very critically in the UK 400 years ago. And the re result in the UK is this concept that there, uh, if justice is to be done, it must be done publicly. And that has been a concept that is waylaid. It's, it's interesting why or how it has been waylaid. So that on the surface, this device of, well, you want the police to have an investigation. The executive says it wants to conduct an investigation into some group of people. 
Well, we get people from the community, 19 to 23 people from the community, and they monitor the investigation. They make sure it's not overstepping and so on. But actually, this has been turned on its head uh, and used as a way to completely subvert the judicial system in the United States. Your comments, well, uh, uh, rather than... Yeah, uh, no, first, again, I would like to say that crucial are the terms that I think you both mentioned, all this extra-legal space, unlawful combatants, and so on and so on. The paradox is that I think we should uh, read these terms as strictly connected to universal human rights. To what? I have nothing against universal human rights. What I'm opposed to is how the reference to universal human rights is de facto used in today's ideological struggles. That in order to sustain support within the space of ruling ideology, universal human rights, you have to construct a space which is no, not, no longer the space of the enemy, in this sense, enemy to whom the rules apply, either Geneva Convention and so on, but you have to create to what the great American thinker and politician Dick Cheney referred to as the gray zone once, you know, like we have to do something discreetly, don't ask us around uh, about it and so on and so on. Here I would say things are even uh, more complex than it may appear because what I find really terrifying is that Concepts like unlawful combatants are becoming legal categories. Now, I'm not a utopian here. Let me be, bru and I will maybe shock some of you, brutally open. I can well imagine a situation where, well, I cannot promise you in advance that I wouldn't torture someone. Let's imagine these ridiculous situations where a bad guy has my young daughter and then I have in my hands a guy, and I know that that guy knows where my daughter is. Well, maybe out of despair, I would have tortured her, him, whatever. What I absolutely oppose to is to legalize this. I think if out of despair, I do something like this, it should remain something unacceptable, you know, that I did out of despair. I am, I, what I am afraid of is that this system gets institutionalized, as it were, where all this will, you know, because we know what is at the end of the road. I had a polemic, just an exchange in New York Times with uh, Alan Dershowitz, who wants legalization of torture. And I read one of his proposals, it's an obscenity. You will have doctors, let's say, just a friendly, to scare you a little bit example. Amy and me are the torturers, you, somebody has to play this role, will be tortured, no? <laughs> so, let's say we call a doctor who, it's an obscenity, who... Speak for who, yourself, Slava. Sorry? Speak for yourself. Okay, sorry, yeah, yeah, okay. okay. No, You're but you know what torturer. I'm saying, who, who investigates you and determines. We can, you can torture him to that degree if, and so on, and so on. For me, what's horrible is not, of course, it is torture at such. But it's even more obscene, this uh, normalization of torture. Which is why, yes, more than you, I mean this respectively, Manning is for me the hero. Because you have a certain moment of glory and so on and so on. That poor guy who, for me, is, did something extraordinary. You know how difficult are these decisions, that simple elementary morality prevails over legal considerations and so on. I think that, I hope I'm not a utopian, I, I even, pro like, don't you have any of these organs who propose candidates for Nobel Peace Prize? That would be a nice crazy movement. If uh, there is a person who deserves Nobel Peace Prize today, it's Manning or people like that. This, you know why? No, no, I'm not bluffing here simple, ordinary people, and I'm not even idealizing him. There are many examples that I know of, ordinary people who were not anything special, they are not saints, but all of a sudden they see something, like probably he, if he is the one, uh, saw all these documents and something told him, sorry, I will not be pushed more, I have to do something here. This is so precious today, because it also goes against 
a note which is in a way true, but it's exploited by our enemies. This idea, ideology today is cynical, people are totally duped and so on. No, they are not. I'm prefer, I prefer her to play a little bit of simple moralism. From time to time, there are ethical, uh, ethical, uh, ethical miracles. There are people who still care and so on and so on. This is very important because, you know, like, let's not leave this domain of a care for simple, dignified, ethical acts to agencies like Catholic Church and so on. Who are they to talk about? Who are they to talk about it? We, the left, should rehabilitate this. I know it doesn't sound very postmodern or cynical. This idea that there are out there quite ordinary guys, nothing special, but who all of a sudden, as if in a miracle, do something wonderful. That's almost, I would say, our only hope today. Sorry for that. Sorry for that example. Don't need to mention. Speaking on that, uh, one of the difficulties for alleged sources, uh, and actually we have another one in prison, which um, has received very little recognition, which is the case of Rudolf Elmer, yeah. who's in prison in Switzerland for allegedly revealing uh, secret bank information. Um, there's no trace to us, but that is the allegation that has been investigated, um, is that if they put up their hands and say, yes, yes, it was me, uh, it makes it very easy to defend them in a moral way. And it makes it very easy to shower them with awards. Um, but until they do that, their, their, their defense is that they didn't do it. So um, it is very hard for, for us to, um, to start praising people because inherent in that praise is uh, we would be alleging that they are, are guilty of the, of the offence. Speaking of banks, Julian, um, you mentioned a while ago that you had a good deal of documents on Bank of America, but they haven't been released. Are you planning to release them? There's a complication with those documents and another group of documents. So we, we are under a type of blackmail in relation to these documents um, that, is very, that will be dealt with over time, but it is quite difficult uh, to deal with at the moment. So I don't want to specify what type of blackmail that is because it might make it harder to address uh, the situation, but it is, um, it is perhaps something like people might guess. Uh, that <laughs> I, you know, there's a range of possibilities and it's probably the first or second possibility if you're, if you're guessing at these things. Well, let's talk about the beginning of WikiLeaks. Tell us about how you founded it, named it, and what your hopes were at the time, and if at this point um, you have been disappointed by what you've been able to accomplish or amazed by it. WikiLeaks, how it started. I think I am amazed by it, of course. I mean, who couldn't be? It's an extraordinary time that I have lived through and to see uh, many of your dreams and ideals come into practice. That said, um, I think we're only about a hundredth of the way there in terms of what we have to re release and discover and collect and, and put into people's heads and uh, solidify in the historical record. Uh, we need a, a cable gate uh, for the CIA, we need a cable gate for the SVR, we need a, a cable gate of the New York Times, actually. Um, all, all the stories that have been suppressed and how they've been managed. And once we start getting that sort of volume and concretize uh, and protect um, the rights of everyone to communicate with one another, which to me is, is the basic ingredient of civilized life. It is um, not the right to speak. What does, the, what does it mean to have the right to speak if you're on the moon and there's no one around? It doesn't mean anything. Um, rather, the right to speak comes from 
our rights to know and the two of us together, someone's right to speak and someone's right to know produce a right to communicate and so that is the grounding uh, structure uh, for all that we treasure about civilised life and by civilised I don't mean industrialised, I mean people collaborating to not do uh, the, d the dumb thing, to instead learn from previous experiences and learn from each other to pull each other, pull with each other together in order to get through the life that we live in a, in a less adverse way. So that quest to protect the historical record and enable everyone to be a contributor to the historical record uh, is something that I have been involved in uh, for about 20 years in one way or another. So that means protecting people who contribute to our shared intellectual record. And it also means protecting publishers and encouraging distribution of historical record to everyone who needs to know about it. After all, an historical record that has something interesting in it that you can't find is no record at all. So that long-term vision is something that I developed in various ways. And I saw in around 2006 that there was a way of achieving justice through this process uh, that could, could be realised using the intellectual and uh, social capital that I had available. And so that's quite a, a complex plan. You should perhaps read, there's a couple of essays on WikiLeaks that go into this uh, in more detail. So, to, to, so to, to pull all this together was a difficult thing to do. It's, um, and to plan it out and to marshal the resources and to build um, not only an ideology that people could support and were encouraged by and the sources were encouraged by, um, but that people would defend. And it's, it's one of the, I think it's extremely interesting that although twice this venue was cancelled, not this venue, sorry, twice this, the venue that we had rented for this was cancelled, including at the Institute uh, uh, for Education from the University of London, under the basis it would be too controversial. And so we, that's why we ended up at, the Trotsk, at, this, at this venue. That despite that, that actually Slavoj Zizek, myself and Amy Goodman have been manage, managed to pack out nearly 2,000 people in London on a Saturday um, at 25 pounds a seat. So I see that as extremely encouraging. On, on the one hand, we have this sort of the everyday tawdry institutional uh, censorship of saying that something is too controversial and therefore you can't hold it in an institute of education. Um, on the other hand, uh, all of you came. And I'm not sure that that would have happened five years ago. In fact, I'm pretty sure that wouldn't have happened five years ago. And that both of those things wouldn't have happened five years ago. So that when I said before that censorship is always an opportunity, and censorship reveals something that is positive about a society. And a society with no censorship is in a very bad state. That the, this, if you like, the censorship of not giving us this venue so easily um, is also related to why you're all here. It is the other side of the coin. That people are worried that change is, po that change is possible. And you're here because you think that change is possible and you're probably right. Um, so that's been a very interesting journey to see that. Uh, and I thought I was pretty cynical uh, and worldly uh, five years ago. Um, and of course I was uh, simply a very young and naive fool uh, in retrospect. Um, and learning how to, from being within side the centre of the storm, I have learnt, no, not just about the structure of government, not just about how power flows 
in many governments around the world that we've dealt with, but rather how history is shaped and distorted by the media. And I think the distortion by the media of history, of all the things that we should know so we can collaborate together as, as a civilization, is, is the worst thing. It, it is our single greatest impediment to advancement. But it's changing. We are, we are routing around um, media that is close to power in all sorts of ways. And, but it's not a foregone conclusion, which is what makes this time so interesting, that we can rest um, the internet and we can rest the various communications mechanisms we have with each other into the values of the new generation that has been educated by the internet has been educated outside of that mainstream media distortion. And all those young people are becoming important within institutions. So may maybe this is something I'll speak about with you later, Amy. But um, I do want to talk about what it means when institutions, how the most powerful institutions, uh, from the CIA to News Corporation are all organized at, all organized using um, computer programmers, using system administrators, using technical young people. What does that mean when all those technical young people adopt a certain value system and that they are in an institution where they do not agree with the value system and yet actually their hands are on the machinery? because there, there has been moments in the past like that. Uh, and though it is those technical young people who are the most internet educated and have the greatest ability to receive the new values that are being spread and the new information and facts about reality that have been spread outside mainstream media distortions. I feel now like that Stalinist commentator, you know, the leader has spoken, I provide the deeper meaning and so on, <laughs> with pleasure. No, first I would really like to begin with what you said, it's extremely important, I have a philosophical term for it. When you moved from right to speak, right to know, communication and so on, I think that, as many of you know, in the history of modern thought, the first one to formulate this was Immanuel Kant in his wonderful distinction between private and public use of reason. This distinction is so wonderful because for Kant, private use of reason is not, I gather with my friends in the kitchen of my apartment or a pub. No, private use of reason is for Kant, theological faculty, legal faculty, political sciences, where what you are thinking, debating, developing, serves a goal set up in advance by a power structure or ideological structure and so on. For Kant, we here, at a distance from this hierarchic uh, political, in the sense of establishment, of course, of establishing power structure space, we are the public use of reason. And why is this so important? Because what I see Wikileaks as part of a global struggle which doesn't concern only in the narrow sense this domain of right to know in the sense of right to information and so on, but even education, you know you, by you I mean UK citizens here what horrors are being made now in the UK university reform, new privatizations and so on and so on. This is all one concerted attack on the public use of reason. It goes on all around Europe. The name is so-called Bologna High Education Reform and the goal is very clear. They say it. It's to make universities more responsive to social life to social problems. It sounds nice. What it really means is that we should all become experts. As a French guy 
later minister explained to me in a debate in Paris. Uh, you, uh, for example, cars are burning in Paris suburbs. What we need is psychologists who will tell us how to control the crowd, urbanists who will tell us how to restructure the streets so that the crowd is easy to break up or whatever. Like, we should be here as a kind of a, a ideological or specialist servicemen to resolve problems formulated by others. I think this is the end of intellectual life as we know it. And we should go here to the end, you know, when all those uh, right-wing anti-immigrant bullshitters are talking about, uh, sorry, I used the word, I shouldn't, yeah. <laughs> Do it in a Stalin's way, put some music of some heroic working class <laughs> song there. Sorry, but more seriously, when we uh, hear about uh, oh, immigrants, Pakistanis, Muslims, a threat to Judeo-Christian civilization. No, sorry, the greatest asset of Judeo-Christian civilization, which you can even detect it in notions of Holy Spirit as a community of believers outside established structures, it's precisely this independent space of public reason. So I'm saying that if there is something really to defend, of the so-called, I hate the word also, Judeo-Christian legacy, this idea of democracy, not only as this masturbatory right to cast a vote totally isolated, but as you said, public space of debate, communication, and so on, then that should be our answer to all those uh, 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 populist anti-immigrants and so uh, anti-immigrant politicians and so on. Not this white liberal guild, oh, you are, uh, you are defending Judeo-Christian legacy, and no, we, we feel guilty, my God, how many bad things we did, all the bad things in the world are the result of European imperialism. Okay, maybe, but what we should say to them is, who are you to even speak about Judeo-Christian legacy? This uh, university reform today in UK, this is the greatest threat of, to Judeo-Christian legacy, and so on. Anti-immigrants, they are the nightmare. Imagine Le Pen in power in France and so on. That's the end of Europe for me in the sense of what is uh, progressive in Europe. So again, this is for me part of a much larger struggle, which especially with the problems to date, ecological problems, for example. It is so crucial. Let me give you an example which I think is so beautifully clear. Recently, and that's why I would also like to ask you, if I may, through you, like, uh, you and China, not you, 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 WikiLeaks and China, because Chinese people will pay such a price for precisely the oppression of public space of reason where? My Chinese friends told me this. In uh, China now, a month or two ago, even the government admitted the catastrophic ecological consequences of those three gorges then. You know, it's the greatest artificial lake in the world for 250 miles, 400 kilometers long. Now they, the government, admitted that the problem is this one. That lake is just above some subterranean faults where, which they move when there is an earthquake. So they admitted that the big, you remember three years ago or when, the big Sichuan or where earthquake was, if not triggered, definitely rendered much stronger because of this. And this is not along the lines of what you must have some proverb like, you know, after the battle, everyone can be the wise general. No, friends, when I visited Beijing four or five years ago, my friends there told me majority of geologists were already warning the government about these dangers. Second thing, because of this collection of water there, the effect of drought are now much stronger felt. Point two, because the water is too low, the whole, uh, you know that the Yellow River is the main, uh, the main uh, transportation line venue in China, and the traffic there is practically stopped, and so on and so on. All this is uh, the end of public reason. So now, uh, just to, uh, just to conclude just one more thing. Nonetheless, this is not a critical point towards you, but a point to clarify what WikiLeaks can do. We should not fetishize truth as such. We live in times of incredible ideological investments of 
times when ideology is very strong precisely because it's not even experienced as ideology and what can happen? Let me tell you a story from Israel, my friends told me there. Some five, six years ago, one of their historians uh, wrote a more truthful account, you know, of how also in the independence 48, 49 war, the Israeli army did burn some Palestinian villages and so on and so on. A more balanced view. And first, all the leftist critics uh, had a kind of intellectual orgasm, oh wonderful and so on. And then they got a shock of lifetime when this guy said, no, 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 but I meant that was necessary to do. We should have done it even more. The line of this guy was, we should have thrown all the Palestinians from the West Bank and we wouldn't have any problems today. So, you know what I'm trying to say? That I disagree not with you, but for example, with another person for whom I have respect, Noam Chomsky. A friend of mine told me that Chomsky told him recently at uh, lunch they had together in New York that today all the obscenities are so clear that we don't need any critique of ideology, we just need to tell to people the truth. No, truth must be contextualized in the sense of what does it justify, what does it say, what does it deny, and so on, and so on. So, to really conclude, this would have been uh, my, my point about WikiLeaks, that you are not just simply telling the truth. You are telling the truth in a very precise way of confronting explicit line of justification, rationalization, or whatever, the public discourse with its implicit presuppositions. It's not just about telling the truth. And this is very important. Why? Now I conclude. Don't be afraid. Because you know this wonderful Marx Brothers joke, which I think serves perfectly as a model of today's ideology. Why? Because, like, if you listen to, if you have listened to someone like, you know, that failed businessman who then ruined the American army as a defense minister, Donald Rumsfeld called, no? No, I read a biography of him, they prove it conclusively that, my God, he was even a very stupid bad manager when he was a, it's a total myth that he was a business genius, but okay, to the point, when, uh, how, uh, uh, basically his cynical line about Iraq, when it was discovered that there were no weapons of mass destruction and so on, was that, uh, okay, we were lying, but we were lying in a truthful way with a good intention, we manipulated you, but this was part of a larger strategy and so on. This is maybe the most, okay, intelligent, tricky and effective cynical defense of a liar. When he said, okay, I'm lying, but so what? I openly confess that I was lying, so in a way, I'm truthful. Here, we should repeat that Marx Brothers saying, and this is what you de facto are doing, I claim. You know that wonderful phrase from Groucho Marx, I think, when he is playing a lawyer, defending his client, and he says, this guy looks as an idiot and acts as an idiot. This shouldn't deceive you, this guy is an idiot. We should say to Donald Rumsfeld, okay, you admit you act as a liar, you are a cheater and a liar. But this will not deceive us. You effectively are a cheater and a liar. We should not allow them this space of selling their lies themselves in a cynical way as a deeper truth. This is how ideology today functions. Julian Assange, I wanted to ask you about the Arab Spring and about what you see as WikiLeaks' role in what started in Tunisia onto Egypt, we're seeing in Bahrain, Yemen, Syria, Libya. What role did WikiLeaks play? It's hard to disentangle, but the, the story that we have back from people who were in Egypt uh, and from the uh, newspaper Al Akbar. Uh, one, one of the great newspapers publishing in the Middle East out of Lebanon. You lived in Egypt for a time. I, I lived in Egypt uh, during 2007, so I am familiar with the Mubarak re regime um, and, and the, the tensions uh, within the Egyptian environment. Actually, I, I was staying at that time in a rather unusual circumstance uh, where um, I was staying in Miss Egypt's house. And 
Miss, Miss Egypt's house, other than having paintings of Miss Egypt all throughout, um, was clustered right between the US Embassy and the British High Commission uh, with a van outside filled with 24 soldiers in front of my front door. And so for the sort of work we were doing, this seemed to be the sort of the ultimate um, cover, if you like, to be right nested amongst this. But, you know, it's an interesting, Egypt's a very interesting place. Um, at that time, you didn't feel in most areas of, areas of Cairo the, the presence of a dictatorship. In fact, if you look out on the streets, men go to work, they go to uh, the cafes to have shisha in the afternoon, the pigeon boys come out uh, onto the roof and there's weddings on a, a Saturday and a Sunday. And in fact, the economic basis and the technological basis to Cairo seemed pretty much the same as London, if you compare it to Australian Aboriginals. So to my mind, actually, if, if we say that it is democracy that rules and manages the United States, or it is democracy, electoral democracy, that manages and rules London, this is, this is completely ridiculous. Because when we look at countries that are dictatorships, or soft dictatorships, as in the case of, of um, Egypt, the day-to-day -day life and the technological activities and the patterns of behavior for most people are exactly the same. But it's, it's when, you, when you stray into those areas uh, of Egypt and areas of Cairo uh, where the interior ministry is or where the foreign ministry is uh, that the, the level of paranoia and fear and, and the number of people um, guarding with submachine guns and so on is increase, increases. At that time, there was around 20,000 uh, political prisoners of different types in Egypt. So, but remember, Egypt has a, a population of around 80 million. So, this is always something that I, I am aware of when, when you have an intelligentsia that writes and writes about its problems, because th this is the mirror image of the problem we now have with the mainstream press, which is writers always write to their own favor and their own considerations and their own self-interests. So a country which goes from a position of, can go from a position of not treating writers well to treating writers well and not treating everyone else well. By writers I mean people who have ability to project the voice. So for those 20,000 political prisoners in Egypt, they could gain no traction in the Western press. And yet, others, such as in Iran, we hear about all the time. It's very interesting that Egypt was perceived to be a strong ally of Israel and a strong ally of the United States in that region. And so all the human rights abuses and political abuses that were occurring every day in Egypt uh, simply did not get traction. And there was one moment where, um, rather actually unusual for Egypt, but, but perhaps a, a sign of the cleverness that came to be represented in the Arab Spring, where these 20,000 prisoners started a strike demanding conjugal rights, demanding that their wives be permitted to visit them in prison for sex and then got some prominent muftis to come out and say, look, it's bad enough that these people are political, political agitators, let alone homosexual political agitators. And that is then something that was picked up um, by uh, the Western press because it had this, this extra salacious flavor. And so that was my, some of my experiences with Egypt um, when I lived there. Later on, when we worked on Cablegate, we selected our French partner, Le Monde, in order to get the cables into, 
into French because we knew that they would have an effect in Francophone Africa. Also, cables were pub published in early December by Al Akbar in Arabic from Lebanon and also Al Masi Al Yum uh, in Egypt. Although the material that was published in Egypt back in December under Mubarak was pretty soft uh, because of the, the threats that that newspaper was under. But Al Masi Al Yum pushed hard. Um, and there was a number of critical cables came out about the Tunisian regime and about Ben Ali. Now, of course, the, the argument that has often been used, including, for example, uh, in the electoral result that we're involved in, in in Kenya in 2007, is you just tell the people uh, what's going on and then they'll be angry about it and they'll oppose it. But actually, the real situation is much more rich and interesting than that. Rather, yes, the, the demos knows, the population starts to know, and they start to know in a way that's undeniable. And they also start to know that the United States knows. The United States can't deny what was going on uh, inside uh, Tunisia. And then the elites within the country and without the country also know what is going and know they can't deny. So a, a situation developed where it was not possible for the United States to support the Ben Ali regime and intervene in a revolution in Tunisia in the way that it might have. Similarly, it was not possible for France to support Ben Ali or other partners in the same way that they might have been able to. Also, in our, in our strategy in dealing with this region uh, and uh, our, st our survival strategy for Cablegate was to overwhelm. That is, we have Saudi Arabia, for example, propping up a number of states in the Middle East, um, uh, in, in fact, invading Bahrain even to, to do this. Um, but when these states have problems of their own to deal with and political crises of their own to deal with, they turn inwards and they can't be involved in this prop up. So Cablegate as a whole caused these elites that prop each other up into region within the Arab speaking countries and within, between Europe and these countries and between the United States and these countries to have to deal with their own political crises and not spend time giving intelligence briefings on activists or sending in um, the SAS or, or other um, support. And activists within Tunisia saw this very quickly. I think they started to, to see an opportunity. Um, and that information, uh, our, our site, a number of WikiLeaks sites were then immediately um, uh, banned by the Tunisian government. Al-Akbar was banned by the Tunisian government. A hacker attack uh, was launched on Al-Akbar. Many were, were launched on us, but we had come to defend against them. Al-Akbar was taken down. Their whole um, newspaper was redirected uh, to a Saudi sex site. Believe it or not, there is such a thing as a Saudi sex site. And they wrested it back through involvement of the foreign, foreign ministry in, in Lebanon, and then what I believe to be state-based computer hackers, because the degree of the sophistication of the attack came in and wiped out all of Al-Akbar's cable publishing efforts. The cables about Tunisia were then spread around um, online um, in, other, in other forms, uh, translated by a little internet group called uh, Tunis Leaks. And so present, presented a number of different facets um, a sort of, that, that everyone could see and no one could deny that the Ben Ali regime was fundamentally corrupt. Um, it's not that the people there didn't know it before, but it became undeniable to everyone, including the United States. And that the United States, or at least the State Department, could be read that if it came down to supporting the army or Ben Ali, they would probably support the army, the military class, rather than the political class. So that gave activists and the army uh, a belief that they could possibly pull it off. But this wasn't enough. 
So all that was intellectual and, and was making a difference and was stirring things up in Tunisia. Uh, and then you had this action by a 26-year-old uh, computer technician who set, um, self-immolated uh, on uh, in De December um, 16 um, last year and, yeah, and was hospitalized and died on January 4th. And that taking a sort of intellectual frustration and irritation and hunger for change and undeniability to an emotional, physical act on the street is then what changed the equation. But th there's other things, that sort of a, a, a more sy systemic issue that was gradually breeding up, which is you had aging rulers in the Middle East that whose regimes to that extent were becoming weaker and that the intellectual management of them was decreasing. Um, you also had the rise of satellite TV and the decision by Al Jazeera staff to film and broadcast protest scenes in the street. So most revolutions kick off in a crowd situation like this one, where everyone can, you know, all the time the regime is saying, um, this voice is an outcast voice. This is a minority. This is not popular opinion. And what the media does is censor those voices and prevents people from understanding that actually that what the state is saying is in the minority is in the majority. And once people realize that their view is in the majority, then they understand they ha physically have the numbers. And there's, there's no better way to do that than in some kind of public square, which is why Tahrir Square in uh, Egypt was so important, because everyone could see that they had the numbers. Um, and that's, you know, this is, I often perceive that there are moments like that politically. Um, yes, the Middle East was one that we might be going through. You know, you, you saw just before the Berlin Wall fell, everyone thought that it was impossible. Why? I mean, if a, if a lot, it's not that people suddenly received a lot of new information. Rather, what the information that they received is that everyone, a large majority of people, had the same beliefs that they had. And people became sure of that. Uh, and then you have a, a sudden switch, a sudden state change, and then you, then you have a revolution. So I often feel that we're, we're on the edge of that and that alternative ways of people becoming aware of what their beliefs are, what each other's beliefs are, uh, is something that introduces that truly democratic shift. And I, I've often lambasted bloggers as people who just want to demonstrate peer value conformity and who don't actually do any original news, don't do any original work uh, when we release original documentation on many things, um, although the situation is very interestingly improving, uh, often we find that, that all these left-wing bloggers do not descend on a fresh cable from Panama, revealing, as it did um, today, uh, that the United States has declared the right to board one-third of all ships in the world without any justification. They do not set, descend on that. Rather, they read the front page of the New York Times and go, I disagree, or I agree, or I agree in my categories. And that is, is something that is sort of that hypocrisy of saying that you care about a situation um, but not actually doing the work is, is something that has angered me. But it, it does serve an important function. The function that it serves is the function of the square. It is to show the number of voices that are lining up on one side or another. Before you respond, I just wanted to ask, since you talked about what you released today, you also have just sued MasterCard and Visa. Can you explain this weekend why you did that? Well, you know, when Daniel Ellsberg released the Pentagon Papers, actually I spoke to Daniel Ellsberg last night, told me an incredible story about that, but did you know the New York Times had a thousand pages of the Pentagon Papers one month before Daniel Ellsberg gave 
the Pentagon Papers, the New York Times. Fresh news. Amazing stuff. Um, yeah, I'll leave that aside. <laughs> um, sorry, what was the question? Oh, yes, the Muscat. So, when Daniel Ellsberg released the Pentagon Papers, did they suddenly change things? Actually, Nixon was re-elected after Daniel Ellsberg released the Pentagon Papers. The Vietnam War didn't stop. The information was very important in all sorts of ways, and its, and its importance over time was very important. The most important thing to come out of the Pentagon Papers was the reaction to the Pentagon Papers, because the Pentagon Papers described a situation in the past, what the past was like, but the reaction to the Pentagon Papers described what was going on right now. And it, sh it showed a tremendous overreach by the, Nix the Nixon administration, various attempts to cover things up. Um, and actually, the New York Times really probably wouldn't have published the Pentagon Papers unless they thought it was going to be published anyway, which they, which they did. It was scheduled to be published um, in four months' time in, in a book. Um, very, very interesting. So, on December 6th last year, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, the Bank of America, uh, Western Union, all ganged up together to engage in an economic blockade against WikiLeaks. And that economic blockade has continued since that point. So it's over six months now we have been suffering from an extrajudicial economic blockade that has occurred without any process whatsoever. In fact, the only two formal investigations into this, one was on January 13 last year by Timothy C. Geithner, the Secretary of the Treasury, who found that there was no lawful excuse to conduct an economic blockade against WikiLeaks. And the other was by a visa subsidiary who was handling our European payments Teller, who found that we were not in breach of any of Visa's bylines or regulations. Those are the only two formal inquiries. And yet, the blockade continues. It's an extraordinary thing that we have seen that Visa, MasterCard, Western Union, and so on, are instruments of US foreign policy, but instruments of US, of not US, as in a state operating under laws foreign policy, but rather instruments of Washington's patronage network policy. So there was no due process at all. And so over the past few months, you know, we have a number of cases on, so we've been a bit distracted, but over the last few months we have built up a case against Visa uh, and MasterCard um, under European law. And Visa and MasterCard together own about 95% of the credit card um, payment industry in Europe. And therefore, they have a sort of market <coughs> dominance. And that means, um, under European law, they uh, cannot engage in certain actions that, uh, to unfairly remove people from the market. Speaking of other legal cases, I just wanted to ask you about what you face next week, the extradition case. On uh, July 12th. The Nation magazine has done two pieces. Um, uh, one is forthcoming. And they quote your new lawyer, Gareth Pierce, who is very well known for representing prisoners at Guantanamo, a renowned human rights attorney. And Tom Hayden, who writes the piece, uh, interviewed many people in Sweden and the United States and sort of talks about a feeling in Sweden of an attack very much represented by your past lawyers on the Swedish justice system and on the integrity of the women in Sweden. And he quotes Gareth Pierce saying that well, his... Well, our lawyers never attacked any integrity of women. Well, he quotes Gareth Pierce saying, the history of this case is as unfortunate as it is possible to imagine. Each of the human beings involved deserves respect and consideration. And I just wanted to ask if you are seeing this as a change of approach with your legal team in dealing with your possible extradition to Sweden. Possibly. I mean, 
the situation, what has happened to Europe and what has happened to Sweden is, is fascinating. I mean, it's something that I have come to learn because I've been embroiled in it. Um, but it is intellectually e extraordinary. So we see, for example, that the European Union introduced an arrest warrant system. And that arrest warrant system to extradite from one state of the EU to another state of the EU was put in place in response to 9-11 to extradite terrorists, to, far, to have fast extradition of terrorists. And it introduced this concept, or rather recycled a, a European Union concept, of mutual recognition. This is sort of a, a very feel-good phrase that one state in the EU mutually recognizes another state in the EU. And that sunk down into mutual recognition between the one court in the EU to another court in the EU. But actually, what it, it seems to be talking about, if you think about it, given the reality that three people a day are extradited from this country to the rest of Europe, is a mutual recognition of the elite in each country in the EU. It is a, a method of, um, of being at peace. So the elite in each country in the EU has, if you like, made literally a treaty with each other to recognize each other um, and to not um, complain about the behavior. Now, you might say that, well, okay, we have justice systems in the EU in various countries. Yes, they, they vary in all sorts of ways. Some are better, some are, some, are, some are worse, depending on your value system. But we have sunk so low that it's not even like that anymore. The European Arrest Warrant talks about the mutual recognition of judicial authorities, so courts. But it, it has permitted each country to define what they call a judicial authority. And Sweden has chosen to call policemen and prosecutors judicial authorities. And the whole basis of this term being used uh, in the original introduction of the European Arrest Warrant was that you would keep the executive separated from the judicial system, that it was meant to be a natural and neutral party um, who would request extradition, and, and it's not. Um, so there, there are many things like this that are going on in that case. I haven't been charged. So is it right to extradite someone to a state where they do not speak the language, where they do not have family, they do not know the, the lawyers, they do not know the legal system, if you don't even have enough evidence to charge them, you won't even come over, as we have offered many times, to speak uh, to the people concerned. So previous complaints about these sort of problems um, have led to some inquiries in Sweden. For instance, the biggest Swedish law magazine that goes out to all the lawyers had a survey on this and one third of the lawyers responding um, said that yes that these complaints about the Swedish judicial system they truly are a problem. Um, on the other hand it is also engendered a situation where the, the Swedish Prime Minister and the Swedish Justice Minister have personally attacked me um, and said the Swedish Prime Minister uh, said that I had been charged to the Swedish public when I hadn't been. Um, so it, it is a delicate situation. There's Sweden, the Sweden we have now is not the Sweden of Olof Palme in the 1970s. Sweden recently sent troops, recently passed a bill uh, to send Marines into Libya. It was the fifth country out to send fighter jets into Libya. This, this is a different dynamic um, that has happened now. And we have to be uh, careful uh, dealing with it. So it, it's one thing to sort of be con considerate of 
differences um, in the way various justice systems are administered. Um, but it, it is it's another to uh, tolerate uh, any difference. And I don't think any difference should be tolerated in the EU. Um, you know, what is it that prevents the justice systems of EU states from fundamentally collapsing and decaying? We say there's mutual recognition. It's mutual recognition between the UK uh, and Romania. And what if the Romanian justice system collapses more and more and more? Who's going to account for that? Who's going to scrutinize it? Is it going to be some bureaucrats in the EC that are going to scrutinize the Romanian justice system? No. The, the only sustainable approach to scrutinizing the justice systems of the EU is the extradition process. So it is extradition lawyers and defendants who have the highest motivation to scrutinize the quality of justice in the state that they are being extradited to. And that's a healthy system that permits outside scrutiny and, and so can stop European states from decaying. Um, but the European arrest warrant system removes that possibility. It's, it's, not, it's not open to us to look at any of the facts in the case, in the extradition at all. That is completely removed. All we're arguing about is whether the two-page request that was filled out, which literally has a box ticked rape, is a valid document. We'll end with Slavoj Žižek. Okay. Uh, first, I'm so sad we don't have time to go into it because I found this, again, yet another this. By this, I mean this strange mutual recognition and this absolutely think about it, what you've heard, this properly Kafkaesque paradox of being extradited without even being charged. I mean, are we aware where we are? Uh, but let's not take that path first. I cannot but restrain from making an obscene, lovingly obscene, a remark of how when you said you were staying with the Tnis of Egypt, no, I hope there will be some American fundamentalist who will say, ah, now everything is clear. There, you were seduced by that miss who was really Al-Qaeda agent and then you were turned into a terrorist agent through her to do your terrorist activity now. Things are clear now, okay. So, let's go on with more... One minute to go. Okay, yeah, yeah, but one minute in this broader Christian sense where time is eternity and so on. <laughs> Very briefly, first, uh, I'll, uh, that also those Palestinian papers that kind of uh, you triggered the movement. I wonder if you agree. I read, I've read them. What made me so depressive is that my liberal Israeli friends were telling me all the time, listen, we admit it, we, we are doing bad things of the West, on the West Bank, but you cannot negotiate if they bomb you. Like, let's just... And if you, of course, uh, uh, examined Gaza on the West Bank, there was practically total peace the last five, six, even more years. The image you get from these papers is that there was an incredible compromising spirit from the Palestinian side, offering them practically entire Jerusalem and so on. And it was absolutely clear that it's Israel which is not interested in peace. Uh, uh, second, uh, just a couple of points. Second point, I think it's so important the exact words you use, which make my point, which confirm my point, namely how uh, undeniable they could no longer deny it and so on. That's important. You know, again, we are in this situation where I know you know, I you that you know, you know that I know. But we can still play this cynical game, let's act as if we don't know. The function of WikiLeaks, even more important, I claim, in concrete ideological political situation, then learning us, then learning through WikiLeaks something new is to, to push us to this point where you cannot pretend not to know. Which is why, let me give you another example. Again, I'm not a total fan of Obama, although I still have certain respect for him, but this is cynicism at its purest. You remember this outcry in Zionist circles where Obama made the simple point that, not even exact frontiers, that the basis of peace should be the borders, the 67 borders. 
my God, uh, the critical reaction was as if Obama said something, I don't know, following orders from Al-Qaeda or what, but this was the official U.S. policy accepted. Only the obscenity of the situation was that although this was officially the U.S. policy, it was part of the unwritten deal not to talk about it, to ignore it. That's our situation here. Step further, uh, Egypt. I know, you know what's for me, and you had here a lot, the truth about Egypt. We Western Europeans had this normal, spontaneous, racist attitude. No, we, we would love to see a, a, a secular democratic movement in Arab countries. Unfortunately, all they can do is some stupid anti-Semitic uh, fundamentalist, uh, nationalist whatever outburst now officially we got exactly what we wanted a purely secular uprising and so on and you know how we behaved my last loving obscene example did you see francois trifo day and night where a guy wants to sleep with a girl tries to convince her for a long time then finally they are alone because of an accident by a lake and again he starts please let's do it quickly we are alone here and the girl says okay Let's do it, and starts to unbutton her trousers. And the guy says, okay, but how do you mean? My God, just like that or whatever, like he is shocked. We were a little bit like that. Officially, we wanted secular democracy. The abjection said, okay, I put down my trousers, here you have your stupid secular democracy, and uh, uh, you cannot get it like, just like that. This was such a clear example of hypocrisy. Now, really, to, uh, to finish, maybe the most important thing, uh, what you already said, I think, Amy, I think maybe this is one of the ways, if we are approaching the end, to conclude it. Even if you ignore WikiLeaks, it changed the entire field. You, it's, again, even at the level of, uh, of publishing, spreading information, you pushed things in a very formal way to a point of undeniability. Nobody can pretend that WikiLeaks didn't happen. And it would be very interesting to classify all reactions to WikiLeaks, you know, as different forms of, in psychoanalytic terms, repression, denial, whatever. Some people say formally, yeah, yeah, but try to neutral, neutralize it like, ooh, another, another chapter in freedom of the press, investigative journalism. Others say directly terrorism. I wonder, the approach I would have followed if I were to be uh, on the other side would have been something like it's basically a good thing, it's just misused by some extremists, you know. And then you kind of uh, say precisely to save the safe core of, good core of WikiLeaks. So what I'm saying is that, again, to conclude, don't worry, this is the moment of truth. WikiLeaks is an event not only because of what it is as in itself, but because nobody can ignore it, it changed the entire field. The point is not to allow to be re-normalized, to remain faithful to it. Um, just a note. Uh... Slavoj and I will be out signing books on the left in the lobby right afterwards and would love to talk to you. Um, definitely well, pick up a flyer. You. Yes, you do. <laughs> and end on, I want to end with this question. Julian, tomorrow, July 3rd, you turn 40 years old. What are your hopes for the future? Well, there's, there's the big future. There's the deep future um, that one can long for. Uh, so, uh, that, that is a future where we are all able to freely communicate our hopes and dreams, factual information about the world with each other, and the historical record is an item that is completely sacrosanct, that would never be changed, never be modified, never be deleted, and that we will steer a course away uh, from Orwell's dictum of he who controls the present. Uh, controls the past. So that, that is something that is my lifelong quest to do. And from, all, from that, um, justice flows because each, most of us uh, have an instinct uh, for justice and most of us are 
reasonably intelligent. And if we can communicate with each other, organize, uh, not be oppressed, and know what's going on, then pretty much the rest falls out. So that is my big hope. In, in the short term, um, it is that my staff stop hassling me to tell me to go. <laughs> what I um, wish you to all the best is another, even more beautiful Miss Egypt. <laughs> 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 What stupid things we have to go for. But really, was she beautiful, Miss Egypt? That was great. Yes, yes. yes she was beautiful. Well, I, 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 uh, we survived. We, we, we sur did. It was very interesting. Okay. Very good Listen, but uh, her, not literally. But I was told, I wasn't told about books. I was told there is no book.